was an uh, activist against the Vietnam War. Uh, he was very involved in trying to stop the war and help people not have to go and fight in Vietnam. He was a conscientious objector. So I always had that in the background of my growing up, knowing that piece of his history and aspiring to be a peace activist in that way. 50 nonviolent revolutions in the past 30 years. And, um, you know, like everybody, I knew that Gandhi was out there and Dr. King had done something, but that was basically it. But as I started to read, I started to recognize some of the stories that I had seen growing up. The revolutions in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Serbia, Poland, uh, East West Germany with the, the wall coming down, the people power revolution in the Philippines, which I would have been five when that happened. And I recognized that the shape of my life and my lifetime had been strongly um, influenced by nonviolent struggle and the ways that people were campaigning for environmental justice and racial justice and gender justice and all sorts of things. Pace e bene mean, is Italian for peace and all good. And they are a 30 year old nonviolence organization that was originally started by Franciscans um, who are a, a branch of Catholics. And um, they hired me to first work on their social media and then do some of their program coordination for two big projects that they work on. One is campaign nonviolence, which organizes people in all 50 states and around the world to work for a culture of peace and active nonviolence, free from war, poverty, racism, and environmental destruction. And every year they organize a week of actions and there's been over 4,000 actions for those goals uh, in the past year. And so it's pretty remarkable effort. But the other program they run is this nonviolent cities program. And uh, several years ago, we heard about a group in Carbondale, Illinois, who were working on this effort to transform their city to a nonviolent city recognizing how much structural violence is embedded in the way that we organize our policies in our cities or how we handle housing, what the police are doing, what our schools are teaching. They started to, they asked their local library to help them introduce principles and practices of nonviolence to different sectors of the city and to inspire their city council to actually become a nonviolent city, to be actively a part of the solution. So inspired by this work, we started to invite other people to form nonviolent cities groups. And now we have over uh, around 50 cities um, with small and large groups. Some of them do very um, targeted projects and some of them have very big projects going on, um, but all of them are looking at how we can make an institutional shift. They are working towards things like getting nonviolence in education into the public schools as the nonviolent school uh, schools project in Rhode Island is doing, um, where they actually teach nonviolence and conflict resolution and they implement restorative justice versus punitive justice. And so they yeah. interrupt what we call the school to prison pipeline, which is a problem in the US where um, children, particularly black and brown children or low income children are being disciplined in their schools to the point where they're expelled and then they're put in the juvenile justice system and then they end up in prison for young people. And that has an extremely negative impact on their lives, uh, imp influencing their opportunities for education, work and housing. Uh, so restorative justice interrupts that cycle. They may also be working on things like getting their city council to divest from weapons and fossil fuels. They may be working on um, doing general nonviolence education, especially active bystander training, so that instead of being immobilized when you see violence starting to erupt on the say the subway, you know how to safely intervene in that without causing further violence. You know how to disrupt the conflict and help those parties back off and cool down and then kind of re-solve uh, their problem in another way. There's a, a thing that happens with nonviolence news is that every time I ask you to pay attention to an injustice or an act of suff or a type of suffering in our world, I'm not leaving you in that place of despair. Mm. I'm always connecting that to how people are protesting this. So we don't think it's normal, it's just gonna happen forever. 
I'm connecting you to how they're going on strike or they're boycotting. I'm connecting you to the solutions that they're proposing, where some of which have decades of proven effectiveness. Yeah. So to me, that's really important. I wish all of our news channels were doing that kind of legwork because th this part of the story is out there. Uh, it's not invisible. <laughs> Oftentimes activists are doing dramatic actions just to get people to know there's an alternative.